We're live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Melanie Yazi, uh, co-host of Red Power Hour. Not really here in a Red Power Hour capacity. Um, we're doing a special podcast interview, an episode today uh, for the Red Nation podcast main feed. I'm joined by some incredible Indigenous women um, from Minnesota, and they're going to introduce themselves here in a moment. But this is the first episode in a five-part series uh, that Red Media is producing as part of the Red Nation podcast. It's about the TRUTH project. TRUTH stands for Towards Recognition in University Tribal Healing. Uh, my lovely guests are going to talk a little bit more about what that means from an Indigenous perspective. Uh, but the TRUTH project um, is has come out of widespread interest um, in the so-called United States following um, the revelations about land-grant institutions uh, that came out in a High Country News article in August of 2020. Uh, it's the first of its kind, actually, to be undertaken by Indigenous researchers um, to hold universities, land-grant universities, the University of Minnesota is a land-grant institution, um, to hold them accountable and to move towards uh, an Indigenous-centered approach to uh, university and tribal relations. And the three guests I have today have really been at the forefront of the Truth Project. So I'm really thrilled you all are here. Um, I'm sure our audience is going to be really excited to hear more about this project. I did a rant on Red Power Hour <laughs> a couple of months ago um, about about the history of the University of Minnesota and how like intensely racist and anti-Indian it is. Um, and so I'm really excited for y'all to provide more context because I can't possibly do that because I haven't actually done the work um, to do the research. So I'm going to hand it off to you. Uh, please introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about how you're involved, the role that you play in the Truth Project. I'll start with you, Misty. Great, Buju, hello. My name is Misty Blue. Um, I'm a member of the White Earth Nation in Northwestern Minnesota. I grew up in the Twin Cities. Um, and my role in the project was, uh, I was appointed by the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council to be the coordinator of the Truth Project. Thanks, Misty. I'm gonna hand it off to you next, Anne. Uh, bonjour, hi, uh, my name is Anne Gerjola. Um, I am a descendant of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, um, and my role on the project uh, was as a project manager on the university side um, through the capacity of research assistant. Um, yeah. Thanks. And then you, Adriana. Uh, Buju, Nindinawe, Magalina Duke, Adriana Goodwin, Nindishna Kaz, Washku, Benesi Kwe, Nindigo, Mainga Nindudim, Miskwagami Wiza, Gai Gani Nindun Jaba. Greetings, relatives. My colonized name is Adriana Goodwin. I am a citizen from the Red Lake Nation. Um, and it is uh, really good to be here today. Niman, Niman Wendam, Oma Ayayan. I had various roles while working on the Truth Project. Um, at first, I was a research assistant, and then a little while later, my tribal council appointed me as the tribal research fellow. And then a little while later, I decided that I wanted to um, fulfill my degree requirements for my master's in public policy um, to do my capstone research. So I was a part of the um, capstone research team as well. Um, so, like I said, it's really good to be here today. Miigwech. Awesome. Thanks so much for those introductions. So let's just get into it. Uh, first question, um, feel free to build off of each other. What is the Truth Project? Anyone can just go for it. <laughs> Maybe I'll start and then you all can fill in. Um, so the Truth Project has been a collaboration between the 11 recognized tribal governments of Minnesota and um, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and the Office of American Indian and Tribal Nations Relations at the University of Minnesota. Um, what we set out to do was start a necessary and timely conversation for the university to reckon with itself as in, um, and its origins as a land grab university. And we wanted to do it uh, in a way that centered indigenous voices and perspectives. So we, <clears throat> We set out on, we created a study, pause, redo. We created a study that had uh, three 
streams of inquiry and action that wanted to um, we, where we wanted to drive transformation of university tribal relations. So we uh, looked at tribal consultation, historical and economic impact, and rematriation efforts. Um, my role was assembling a team of Native scholars who could examine the past, present, and future of tribal nation of tribal university relations. Um, since the university opened in 1851, and we called this team the Tribal Research Fellows, and each of each of our fellows conducted a place-based, tribally-based um, study using archival and indigenous methodologies. Um, we presented that information and uh, Anne's research and Adriana's research at the Truth Project Symposium in May of 2022. Anna and Andriana, do you want to build on that? Um, so I would just say that in addition uh, to the tribal research fellows, there was also a team at the university uh, who I helped to coordinate um, under um, the American Indian and Tribal Nations Relations Office. So there was uh, several research assistants um, besides Adrieta and myself who were involved in the project. And primarily what we did was um, went into the archives at the university and at the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, specifically, my role in that process was to look into the roles that the founding Board of Regents played in um, Indigenous land dispossession and genocide um, in order to uh, found the institution. So. Then, in addition to that, we also coordinated with um, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs, who did uh, an economic analysis of the Permanent University Fund that was created out of uh, these, what we learned were multiple land grabs that the University of Minnesota had access to. Um, um, Whereas a lot of universities only had one, like through the Morrill Act, if they were a land grant institution. Um, because of the roles that the founding board of regents, um, men like Henry Sibley, Alexander Ramsey, Henry Rice, um, they were all very um, active in colonial politics at the time um, and were able to use their influence in order to access uh, more lands um, and primarily, you know, uh, using the university then as a shell corporation, right, to funnel these lands into and then funnel out wealth, um, a lot of that wealth into their own pockets um, and into, you know, the uh, permanent endowment of the university uh, because of their connections in politics and uh, local industries like timber, um, the logging industry, mining, um, and other various forms like uh, railroading. And to um, build off of everything that Misty and Ann had mentioned, in 2020, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council passed a series of resolutions that called for this um, project to take place. Um, and then, you know, with the help of Ann and that in internal core team um, like Tad Johnson, they went, um, they applied for a funding and then we received a Just Futures grant. Correct, Anne and Misty, I, I think that's what it is. And um, from that grant, then um, it was subawarded to each of the tribal nations. And that's how we were able to fund the tribal research fellows. And through, you know, these collaborations, it just started to grow and grow and grow um, into kind of what it's transpiring to be now with the Red Nation podcast and with the publishing of the report. Um, so yeah, so this has been an ongoing process for a few years now and it feels really good to be here finally in this moment yes i agree with adriana it does feel like really really good to be here in this moment and to like get to this point of uh, presenting research uh, both to tribal nations here in minnesota and um, to the greater public so that um, this truth can get out there, right? Because I think for so long, 
universities, higher education has controlled this narrative of what a land grant institution is, right? And really like spun that narrative um, in benefit of promoting themselves. And then by virtue of that, right? Like increasing the uh, revenue that they made, right? Off of being a land grant institution. Um, so I did want to say something to the funding, like Adriana brought up that we were funded under uh, Minnesota Transform, under a Mellon grant, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant um, called Just Futures. Um, and we were able to subaward, you know, the majority of that funding to the tribes in order to support tribal research fellows. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that one, like we see this as a very first step in um, a truth-telling, healing um, change process that needs to happen at the university um, and in Minnesota more broadly, right? Um, but also the m amount of money that we were able to give the tribes wasn't enough to support a person to do this work fully, right? Um, it, it, um, it was difficult at times uh, because of the lack of resources. So I'm just especially grateful to the tribal research fellows who, you know, did all of this work, um, you know, in that capacity and under the stress and um, just knowing that this was really difficult work, right? This was really like, uh, it was like heart work, right? Gut work, um, it was, um, emotionally challenging and spiritually challenging. And so um, I'm just really appreciative of everybody who put so much time and uh, dedication into this project, um, because I think that it's really driving the institution uh, to move faster towards change um, than it ever would have um, normally if, if this project hadn't been going. Yeah, um, you know, I'm a professor. I I work. The university has been my employer for several years, and universities don't hold themselves accountable <laughs> for anything. Um, in fact, the only the only kind of significant change and reallocation of resources comes with a challenge, usually from students or from communities. Um, and so I think this is very much in that tradition. You know, like American Indian Studies, where I work at um, at the U, is the oldest AIS program in the country, and it was only established because of student and community pressure um, on the university back in the day. Uh, so I'm gonna skip the line here with some of the with the questions I had prepped, and I actually want to ask you to talk a little bit more about the report. So you've referenced this report. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the report? When is it coming out? Um, why was a report kind of the the deliverable? Um, when folks were kind of conceiving of what this project would look like? And then what are some of the things that, that the report includes? For, um, the report has been one of the deliverables. Uh, we wanted to make sure that as much as possible, this work could be um, tribally led. And so hosting the symposium was the first step because um, it was something I think that, you know, honors a lot of our cultural practices and our ways of just, we're having, we're opening this conversation. We want people to um, discuss, uh, come together and discuss uh, what are some of the pieces of the study that we've found? What are some of the findings? Um, and we don't want to have to rely on the written word. Uh, like Anne mentioned, you know, there was, budgetary constraints, there was timeline constraints. And um, so that was first and foremost, I think our, our uh, one of our biggest goals was to, was to host that. And second, uh, the report will be released um, within the next couple of months. I don't know when it's gonna be released. I will just say the report will be released soon and that was important to us uh, because it's, you know, it's something that people don't take lightly. And I think it's also, we've had a lot of people who have been interested in our work. And so in order for us to be able to show 
uh, our process and what in our findings for others to to think about um, how they might reckon with their origin the origins of the land grant institution where they work. Um, we wanted to to have something that was written in. Yeah, I just want to kind of um, add to what Misty said. Like even before. When we were like writing uh, letters of interest, right, to try to get into um, the Mellon project, um, there was a question of, you know, what would the deliverables be, right? Um, and I think that at that time, um, our thought process was that um, our audience was university administrators because we were really pushing for change. Um, and it was a way of using colonizer tools against them, right? We went into the archives. Um, they kept really good records of, of what they did to us, of what they did to our people, right? Like, like they were proud of it or something, right? Like everything is so well documented and preserved that um, everything we got was like barely scraping the surface of what is in the archives, you know? And so we always say, you know, who knows what's really down there, you know, because of all, we spent six months in the archives and, and what we found was like just in a few collections, right? We didn't even go through the vast majority of what exists in the archives. Um, but we knew that in order for our project to be taken seriously within the institution, it had to do two things, right? It had to kind of um, use uh, the the prescribed like modes of research. So um, while we wanted to center indigenous voices, tribal voices um, by, you know, inviting tribes through MIAC to participate in this process, um, we also knew that we were going to have to look into um, this quantitatively too, right? And so that's where uh, the Cura folks came in with their economic analyses, where Adriana's capstone team came in furthering that research um, because they were able to, uh, there was indigenous people on both of those teams and they were able to look at the quantitative process through an indigenous lens and still present it to the university um, in their language, right? Um, so when we're presenting it to tribes, I think we present it a lot differently, um, but the paper specifically um, is to try to uh, get to those administrators, right? And to get them to hear our voices. And that's not like something that we um, is explicitly stated in the report either. All of those like um, those challenges, right? For other people to understand this issue in a way that makes most sense to them, you know, and although we shouldn't have to do that, it's something that we have to do, like Anne had mentioned. Um, and I also really want to take a moment to highlight you know, all of that behind the scenes work that took place. Um, Anne mentioned the emotional kind of toll that it took on us as researchers um, and some of that behind the scenes work that we did as a core team um, with bringing different spiritual advisors in. And I don't know if Misty wants to talk a little bit about that because the way she speaks about it is just really, um, it's really great. Um, about that circle closing, so. I don't know if I can remember it anymore, how I used to talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna pause, I'm not sure. That's cool. <laughs> I wonder, okay. I'm totally going off script here, but I feel like that's fine. So I wanted to, you've already mentioned kind of who has been involved in the project. So like who is the audience, for example, of the report you were talking about university administrators, and then that drove kind of the methodology. Um, but you said that it's, you know, different. It, there, there are so many people involved. I think this is the other thing I want to really underline here is there are actually so many different people who have been involved in this report, indigenous people, um, that maybe you can talk a little bit more about the tribal research fellows. Um, and also, if 
I don't know. Is there like an interesting story? Maybe you can't tell this. Maybe it's attached to like MIAC, the Minnesota um, Indian Affairs Council. But like what what was the story like when people began to talk about this that later became the Truth Project? Like how did this start? Um, was it at a state level? Was it a conversation amongst Native students? Um, how did this come into being? And then who are, I'm mostly interested in like, who are the indigenous people who've been involved in shaping this project? Because it's really powerful and beautiful. And I, I, a lot of our listeners, even me, you know, I'm Navajo, I'm like from the Southwest. I'm very unfamiliar with the landscape um, of indigenous people and politics and the geography here in this state. And I'm assuming a lot of our listeners probably are unfamiliar as well. And so if you can just like give us a picture of the scope really of the of the indigenous input into this project um but then also the story you know behind like how it came into existence maybe i'll start just with the first question and then you can talk more about the origins and would that be okay okay um so as audrina mentioned uh the the minnesota indian affairs council um they made three resolutions in the in June of 2020 basically calling calling out the university and um, I'm sure you can link to that and then the funding happened um, I was appointed by the Minnesota Union Affairs Council um, and I'm not sure if a lot, if everyone has um, I'm not sure if every state has some an entity that is like the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, but it is a state entity that um, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council is a state entity that is uh, has representation from uh, all of the eleven tribes here, and um, their mission is to protect the sovereignty and self determination of the tribes and of tribal of Native people. And so they have, um, they operate, uh, you know, as a government body. And so again, there's, um, so there's this body of uh, all, you know, native leadership who could serve as a um, counterpart to the university. So there's, uh, so that's one, one body of people. And then at the university, there is uh, our core team. So that was Anne and Adriana and other uh, research assistants. And then once we started, we, so my role, I was tasked with sort of uh, getting the word out about this project and working with the tribes and Tad and I, Tad Johnson, uh, Regent Tad Johnson, when before he, t he took his role as regent, he worked with me to um, to go to each of the tribes. At that time, it was COVID. So we went in person to some and then mostly did Zooms or phone calls with others. Um, and just to get the word out, this is sort of a history that was um, kind of covered up and nobody really knew about it. So we uh, talked to different people at the at the tribes to um, first tell people about it and then to have an ask and say, would you uh, be willing to engage with our project? And, you know, people showed up and people were interested. And also, you know, people were rightfully uh, upset about this history. And um as Adriana said, it was very, you know, it was very spiritual work. It was a lot of, um, it was very challenging. And I think at the same time, it was uh, healing in the way that people discovered um, a history that was buried. And it's given us, I think, our team and, and people who are interested in this, in this uh, issue, it's given us a lot of understanding about how uh, the state was uh, how the state of Minnesota came into came, came into fruition and how the university played a role in that. Um, I feel like there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I'm gonna I'll pause there. Yeah, 
so I can kind of speak to like the origins of the project. Um, so, uh, the university, uh, was originally founded in 1851 as a territorial institution. Um, so we have about 171 years, right, of leadership at the university, um, that was absent of any indigenous voices. So in 2020, um, President Gable, president of the University of Minnesota, appointed uh, Tad Johnson, who was a professor at that time um, and has now been elected to regent, uh, first native on the board of regents also. Um, but he was uh, the first native and appointed to a senior, senior leadership position. Um, and uh, he has, you know, an extensive history of service uh, to Indian country um, and working on, like, amazing projects um, that have benefited tribes. Um, and so I think there was a lot of um, relationship that was already built between Tad and Mayak and the 11 tribal nations who are recognized federally with and, and who reside within the boundaries of the state of Minnesota, right? Um, that uh, he was able to kind of um, begin discussions, right? So uh, we talked about how um, Mayak issues a series of resolutions. Well, in one of those resolutions, there was 17 asks of the university um, kind of like, uh, things the university could do to start to act, uh, like a better relative to indigenous peoples. Um, and one of those was an accounting of the past, present, and future of university tribal relations. And so that is kind of where, uh, truth is born out of. And, um, so we looked for funding for a while, right, to to kind of uh, get this project up and running. We went to um, several foundations, um, and we kept hearing the same thing. You know, this this is a really great sounding project, um, but if the university is taking it seriously, right, we know that institutions show how they value a project by where they place their money, and the university just wasn't placing any money. Um, towards the truth project. And so we kept hearing from these organizations, um, this is a really great idea, but if the university was serious about this, you know, they would, you know, be, be putting money behind it. You know, they have to have some skin in the game too. And so that, um, then um, I think in the summer of 2020, then um, is when uh, the Mellon Foundation kind of like, uh, released a call for call for proposals um and so uh minnesota transform is the um umbrella partnership uh from the university of minnesota that houses uh several racial justice oriented projects of which truth is is one of them and so um we were able to partner with MIAC, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, um, and the 11 recognized tribal nations of Minnesota, uh, so that each of those nations could tell their stories, right? Past, present, and future of university tribal relations and what they would like to see going forward. Um, so I think one important thing to really note at this point in time is that uh, the Truth Project did not uh, include the viewpoints or stories of any of the Dakota people who were forcibly exiled from the state of Minnesota by the very same men who founded the University of Minnesota, right? And so um, it just wasn't in the scope of the project. There wasn't funding um, because our partner was MIAC. Um, they have a very uh, specific mission to the tribes within the state of Minnesota as a government entity. And so um, we had to stick within the, the parameters that were kind of like, you know, um, boxing us in there, right? When, even though it's a really great project, we recognize that, you know, there are these huge limitations, right? Um, and so uh, I think the, the idea of this was always to like move towards healing. Um, 
But I think we also need to acknowledge there that there's been centuries of harm that have been perpetrated. Um, and getting this out into the open is like one step, right? Um, but there's still a significant wound there. Um, and it's going to take as long uh, to heal as, you know, damage was inflicted upon our nations um, and intentional actions, right, on behalf of the university in order to start to um, build better relationships with the tribes and to build better policies and actions institutionally that do not continue to reproduce harm. Oh, and then just to like go way back to uh, Misty's comment about when the tri when the report will be published. So <laughs> we're uh, we're working on it. Um, as as we have kind of mentioned, um, Tat was uh, appointed by the governor last fall or last uh, summer, like really suddenly, to an open position on the Board of Regents. And so it took us a while to recalibrate, right? He was the leadership on the project, on the university side, um, and uh, there was nobody that was appointed by the university to step in and kind of like fill that role um, when Tad was put to regent. So it took us just a while as like graduate students and we had um, an advisory board that was primarily um, Native faculty and staff from the five campuses um, of the University of Minnesota who um, helped us through that project um, and really helped us like reorient and um, kind of uh, push forward even, even despite that. So even though the report was supposed to be out <laughs> last June, um, we're looking at presenting it to uh, the tribes at the next MIAC meeting in its final form um, in March. And then um, shortly after that, it will be put up on um, websites. So both uh, MIAC and uh, the Truth Project website, um, because part of, part of our contracts uh, were very specific in making sure that uh, data sovereignty was protected at all stages of the project um, because we know that universities do not always respect tribal sovereignty and when it comes to tribal data um, there's really not any processes in place um, so all of our uh, contracts with MIAC and with the tribes say that that research that data um, belongs to the tribes and what they want to share publicly and with the university um, is up to them. And then to add off of to what Misty and Ann said too, like, like the stars aligned for this project to happen is kind of like also how I feel. Um, just like the convergence of all of us to be in this space and time together is, is also really profound. Um, and there was all of these things that were like happening, building up to this moment, um, you know, across Turtle Island, uh, uh, across, you know, indigenous peoples all over the world. You know, like we're, we're in this moment of truth telling. We're in this moment of reclaiming who we are. We're in this moment of re-indigenizing um, our communities. Um, you know, we're in this moment where we have the opportunity to be able to conduct this research um, that meets or exceeds, and I would even say it exceeds um, current research expectations or the research that has been done in our communities and on our communities, because what we bring as a team of Indigenous researchers is something that previous researchers didn't have. They didn't have, you know, the the connection that we have to the water, to the trees, to the land. Um, and I can see that I'm kind of lagging a little bit here. My my screen is. Um, but yeah, you know, so much has been taken from us, continues to be taken from us. And I and I really wanted to get, you know, emotional when Misty was talking um, because it's it still very much affects us. 
Um, you know, as a team of researchers, researchers, we're all going through our own things, uh, but we continue to show up for one another. We continue to show up for our people. And then we have people like you, Melanie, who um, show up for us and continue to support us and continue to support this work. Um, and really just emphasizing, you know, that, that the stars aligned for this to happen. Um, our spirituality is beautiful. Our connection is beautiful. And, you know, I don't have to, we don't have to hide that part of us. Um, cause we get it. You know what I mean? We get that connection. Um, and so, yeah, this project was beautiful and it really was the way that we collaborated with one another. It was the way that we saw one another. Um, and yeah. And so if that's part of the project that can be recreated, it's that collaboration. It's that family. Um, it's, it's those things, though, those things that make us who we are as Anishinaabe people, uh, those grandfather teachings, love, compassion, empathy, you know, all of those things that colonizers and settlers didn't give to us, you know, it's just take, 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 take. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that's my, I guess my encouragement is that it is this, um, it was the connection, the community, the love, the support. Um, that healing piece, you know, um, there's been so much that we don't know as indigenous peoples, we hear the stories, we feel the stories, we feel that trauma. Um, and as hard as it was to be in the archives, to get those nitty gritty details of these heinous crimes, you know, we need that documentation to shift policy. Um, and when this report comes out, you know, we're going to have lots of supporting documentation um, as an argument demanding institutional change. And um, one more thing too, uh, Anne and I had an opportunity to be a part of an event leading for the seventh generation. And it's generally acceptable that a generation is about 25 years. So seven generations ago would have been about the same time that the University of Minnesota was being created. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of those stories in our c communities a a across Turtle Island again about that seventh generation. And so the work that we're doing now is shaping the next seven generations. Um, and the way we came together is just so beautiful. And it's um, evidence, you know, that even though they stripped all of these things away from us, they didn't take the things that were most important to us as a community. Um, and here we are, stand up, fight back, uh, using their tools, um, the same tools that took so much away from us. Here we are, taking it back. I just wanted to quick add something. Um, in addition to it being sort of a timely moment, right? Because, because you know, we're, we're definitely reckoning with these systems that these settler systems that have been built in different ways. So, you know, Minneapolis um, Police, uh, University of Minnesota as a land grab institution, we're, th we're trying to think about um, different ways to be kinder to the land and to the water. We all need to be thinking about that. I think the other piece that feels important about the process and about this project is that in doing this research study, we wanted to really push back against a lot of uh, subtler ways of knowing and and learning and um, conducting research. And so that is why we did this so collaboratively. I think it really was important for us to do this collectively. I think, you know, the, the, the university will always um, uplift one person or, you know, try to find uh, one person who, who has the deepest knowledge of something, but, you know, it was really important for us to do this as a team and to involve everyone. I think, you know, especially, you know, the, the, the sign of any vibrant ecosystem is how um, biodiverse that it is. And I think that the richness that our project um, has created has been because everyone was involved in it. And so, you know, not shying away from complexity, um, taking the time that we've needed to take on this project was important for us. Um, 
you know, again, hosting a symposium so that people could just show up in, in a way that, um, that honors themselves as, as human beings and not, not as, you know, um, one person representing, uh, a knowledge system or something like that. So thanks for that reminder, Adriana. Well, when you were speaking, Adriana, about the seventh generation, I got goosebumps because it's um, it sounds like you all are the seventh generation from the when this story of dispossession begins um, 171 years ago. Right. So there's something almost like uh, like prophetic <laughs> about it. I, I'm going to tell you that, you know, I'm very new here and when I learned about this project and then when I came to listen to you all um, back in November, you were giving a presentation on um, the National Women's Studies Association was holding their annual conference in Minneapolis. It was uh, it was like the spirit of the project. I, I literally felt that like I felt it in my heart. And that's what drove me to want to contact you to to do this and to move down this path. The spirit of this project is really powerful. Um, I just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> you know, somebody who's not involved, but who's like an indigenous person who has like my antenna out <laughs> for like <laughs> these kinds of things. Um, there's something really special, I think, going on here that, yeah, it's just powerful. And it sounds like it's because of the collaborative spirit. But also, um, you know, what you're talking about, um, Misty, with the just... It is about the collaboration, but it's also how indigenous it is and how uh, indigenous folks here in this place have taken control in a way of the narrative, not in a bad way, but are really like reversing the role, you know, that the university gets to claim the narrative, it gets to exceptionalize individual voices and academics, it gets to claim expertise, it gets to claim, you know, um, the monopoly on what constitutes knowledge. And what's really beautiful about this project is it's turned that completely on its head. And indigenous folks are doing this from an extremely indigenous centered, a very unapologetically indigenous centered perspective. And like the university can't claim any of it. <laughs> you know, It wouldn't even fund the project like too bad for the university because, you know, like it doesn't even have any control. And also the data sovereignty piece that this knowledge is still going to be firmly within the hands of indigenous nations um, who get to decide, you know, what constitutes ethics in terms of how the knowledge is shared and, um, you know, what, what the knowledge is used for. And again, like this, I don't see this happen very often at the scale that it's happening here. And I think that's what makes it really special to me. Um, you know, Misty, I know you have to go soon. <laughs> if you need to hop out while we're talking, that's totally fine. Um, I have a couple of questions before we close out. Uh, so you're talking obviously about the history, the land grab history of the University of Minnesota. If you could briefly in like two to three minutes, what is that history? If you can give us like the highlights of settler colonialism, oh, sorry, that sounded icky. Don't give me the highlights. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what is the land grab history of the University of Minnesota? Um, and then kind of building off of that, what are some of the key findings from the report that you can talk about now before the report actually drops? Um, so what are some of the key findings? Um, and then lastly, so what are the next steps after the report? Um, the report drops hopefully in March. And I can repeat those questions if you need me to. <laughs> and don't worry if your camera's lagging, if we can hear your audio fine anyway. So I can try to like briefly summarize like the history of, um, the land grab here um, in Minnesota. So in 1851, um, Henry Sibley, uh, who was a founding regent and also um, one of the first governors of the state of Minnesota um, and a senator, a territorial uh, representative to Congress at the time, um, was able to get written into the Enabling Act, which uh, basically is how the settlers of this land voted to make Minnesota from a territory to a state, um, that there would be um, 
two townships worth of land donated to the university from the federal government. Uh, we know that that land wasn't donated. It was stolen uh, from indigenous nations, primarily from Dakota nations. Um, and also um, in that area, there was some up in uh, the Arrowhead region of that, that affected Anishinaabeg tribes um, in that, that early land grab. Um, and that two townships of land would go to fund uh, the permanent endowment of the University of Minnesota um, territorial institution, right? Because at this time it was a territory, it was not yet a state. Um, so they basically sold those two townships of land and um, raised all of these funds. Uh, but the founding board of regents mismanaged the funds so grossly uh, that the university had to shut down. It went bankrupt um, and there was a legislative inquest. And uh, what came out of that was called the Heaton Report. And the legislators uh, that were involved in the Heaton Report, it was a bipartisan report, uh, found that the founding regents uh, had kind of foregone the good of both the institution and the state, right? Never mind the indigenous folks, right? Who who were really the ones who, who were paying the price, right? Um, that they had uh, basically gone about all of this in order to uh, stuff money into their own pockets, the founding regents did. Um, but, but what's funny about that is then when the university opened back up, a lot of these same men were appointed again to be on the, the Board of Regents for the state university. So in between those years, 1860-ish uh, to 1868, um, the university was closed down um, and an emergency board was appointed by the state legislature. Um, and that board was uh, headed by John Sergeant Pillsbury, who we may know from like um, bread and stuff, right? Like Pillsbury Doughboy, like that Pillsbury. Um, and he uh, basically lobbied then Senator Henry Rice, who is also a Board of Regent, uh, to uh, lobby the federal government for an additional uh, 96,000 acres of land. Uh, they used the argument that uh, the first land grab was for a territorial institution, um, but the federal government had written into the Enabling Act that uh, there would be another two townships of land uh, given to the state of Minnesota for a state institution. So, you know, that, that ambiguous wording, um, I feel, based on our research, was uh, purposeful on parts of the regents who were also the politicians at the time, right? There's a lot of um, just... Uh, I don't know, I can't think of the word right now, but just like abuse of power, right, in there um, and corruption um, because there was never a clear delineation between what was the business of the university, what was the business of the state, and what was the business of these men who founded the institution and who founded a lot of the um, other institutions in this state, right? And so... Um, the, there was a total of uh, about 186,000 acres of land that were given to the University of Minnesota, uh, stolen from uh, the tribal nations of Minnesota and given to the University of Minnesota in order to fund their permanent uh, university fund. Um, now we know that those PUF funds uh, be Permanent University Fund uh, are supposed to be held in perpetuity, right? And so the university, um, oh, I think we should also add that like this builds off of, we should have said this like way long ago, this builds off of the research that was done by Lee and Aton, um through the Land Grab University article, right? Because they're the ones who like really pointed out that even though the University of Minnesota received like the least amount of lands in the Moral Act, they were able to like have one of the largest returns on investment, right? And so the Truth Project was really looking into that. And so I think um, we didn't really know what the extent of that was until Adriana's team uh, began to really dig into the um, 
archives and into like uh not just the archives of the university but of like uh the state treasurer um and and figure out that um even though they had to hold these funds in perpetuity and Adriana can like correct me on the wording um or maybe you just want to say it because you say it really good <laughs> like uh what they used those puff funds for it wasn't just for the university uh, yeah, and I want to add to, like, when we think about what was happening here in the 1840s, in the 1850s, in the 1860s, all of these violent acts that were being taken um, against the Ojibwe people, against the Dakota people, against the Winnebago people, against all of the Indigenous peoples that were here, um, these acts of violence were deliberate. Um, and, you know, they utilized, again, like the written word, sending letters, all of these things to like collaborate with one another or however you want to say that they were very much aware and they very much use what they knew about our people against us. Um, and so when the 1862 Moral Act was signed and passed by legislation, just Prior to that, the Dakota Indian Wars had ended and what that did to the Dakota people. Um, and so they were very deliberate about that. And so even when we signed our treaty negotiations at Red Lake, it was after the Dakota Indian Wars had ended. Um, so, so, so yeah, so just the violence that, that took place for them to acquire this land. Um, and Anne mentioned the Permanent University Fund. And so this is the permanent fund um, that was created for the sales of these lands that Anne had mentioned. Um, so through archival research, through looking at, you know, audits and, and different accounting systems, um, we found that there is about 24,000 acres of land from these takings of land that Anne had mentioned that are still accruing iron ore royalties today. Um, so from 1880 to 2022, uh, these 24,000 acres of land are um, have accrued about $170 million um, in revenue. So that's not adjusted for inflation. And so this number is not even taking into account the sale of that iron ore. Um, and so all of the other things that are included in this final number. So this is just one sliver from this one pot of money. Um, and, in, and in addition to that, we also came across um, evidence that they were using the permanent university fund. Um, and so what that means, they have to keep it in perpetuity. So Anne was kind of getting to that. And so what that means is that essentially it just needs to be on the books. So that $170 million just needs to be accounted for on the books. And so what they did was they bonded this money out to various municipalities across the state of Minnesota. And so essentially what we know as the state of Minnesota was built and created on this fund um, that, that ties back to all of this taking of land that was taken violently from our people. Um, and so that, that was a really big key finding. Um, again, it's just scratching the surface. And we still don't even have a full account of the you know, like the revenue. So these bonds had like a 4% interest rate tied to them. Um, so we don't know where the income um, that was derived from, from that, where that went. Um, and so it, it was really difficult to find all of that information because it's not just like a couple clicks, like they have it hidden. You have to like put in requests. And we also did put in requests and we didn't get information back, um, but we still found out stuff and, um, yeah, I think I think that's it for now. <laughs> so it sounds like forensic accounting, is that the correct term, has also been a huge part of this project and um, the university hasn't always been cooperative <laughs> in providing that information or even keeping track, right? You were saying, Anne, that like colonizers, this is true if you go into like the National Archives, Colonizers are really meticulous about keeping track of like colonialism <laughs> and like genocide of our people. And yeah, but then the money, they're like, we don't know what happened to it. <laughs> you know? Are you going to say something, Anne? Yeah, I was just going to say something about the archives because um, I think another 
point uh, that we tried to like center throughout this whole thing was um, to empower, right? To empower the tribal research fellows and to empower the tribes and um, teaching folks, you know, how to uh, do archival research um, and how to uh, just their rights, right? Their rights around accessing that information. Um, one of our research fellows from Leech Lake, Glory Harper, has um, led a couple of expeditions of folks from her tribe to various um, uh, archives because she found that uh, a lot of the tribe's archives don't even exist within the state of Minnesota, right? So it wasn't just that they like took this knowledge from us, they like removed it so far that, you know, they didn't expect us to be able to find it, right? So being able to like know that tribes are going into these archives and finding information and rematriating um, that knowledge and uh, any anything that they may find to bring back with them, I think, is great, you know, and I know that Adriana has played a huge role um, in that rematriation process uh, at the university archives. And then, too, through, like, the Truth Project, um, you know, all of these other, like, kind of collaborations have kind of started to grow because of them. Um, and so right now I'm working with the university archives to process the Helen Mudgett collection. Um, kind of wanting to talk a little bit about that history. So anyways, this collection sat at the Minnesota Historical Society for 50 years and no one saw it. And like the way that the that when they sent the email to the university, um, yeah, that's what they said. It just sat there for 50 years. They didn't have time to process it. Um, you know, here, here, here you go. Like, and so there's also a part of that within the archival systems as well where there really needs to be progress made on that. Um, because again, we don't even know what's in the archives. And um, it's just like kind of crazy to me that this lady did all of this work in indigenous communities here in Minnesota and here her manuscript sits on treaties and all of these things for 50 years. And I'm like one of the first people to see it since like the 1960s. Like, it's just like crazy to me. Um, but it was like through that collaboration, through that networking, you know, that this work continues. Um, and really just emphasizing to, you know, just the need for this work to continue. Yeah, and you know, I just wanna say that uh, the archivists at the university archives have been like so incredibly helpful and supportive during this entire project, right? They could have like, made it really difficult, you know, like, you know, just like followed standard practice, right? That just makes it difficult to do community-based research in and of itself, right? Standard university research practices. Um, but they were really open to um, indigenizing their processes and to opening their collections to community um, and, and working to figure out, um, you know, I remember uh, when one you know, time along the way where uh, Ellen, uh, the archivist, reached out and said, you know, we have some of these recordings online, but I don't know that they should be like publicly available, you know, and just like that acknowledgement um, and acknowledging that, you know, I think so often like academia views like that they have the right to like all knowledge, right? And like just trying to get people to understand that some some knowledge some information is not for you you know and and it's sacred to people and it's um a lot of stuff that has been kept from communities and to be able to um have folks who are aware of that tension and and to work to find ways to like uh just um, remove those things from like public access, right? And, and you know, the work that Adriana is doing with them to, to get it back to the proper communities um, is just like really important, right? And one step uh, towards like uh, healing, 
because that genocide that took place, you know, that violence, it wasn't just enacted against people, right? It was enacted against our culture and our knowledge ways. Um, and they simultaneously like prevented our ancestors from practicing their traditional ways while like coveting that knowledge for themselves, right? And, and taking it and hiding it into the archives. And so uh, just opening that back up to community has been really powerful. Well, there's an entire conversation about the politics of the archive that can be had too. Um, I've been talking to other indigenous librarians. Librarians and archivists are like some of the most radical people. <laughs> universities isn't it it's like it's really true they're like uh, they're like hidden like ratty baddies um and so i'm not surprised <laughs> that the archivists were really great to work with um but yeah maybe we can have a conversation about the politics of the archives later on down the road uh it occurred to me i know we're almost at an hour um and i didn't tell you i was going to ask you yet another question but i realized that i we haven't talked and maybe we can do this in another episode since we have five episodes to cover stuff related to the truth project but like what are the contemporary legacies or like what are the contemporary injustices that we can actually trace to like the original land dispossession um that the university of minnesota was instrumental and the founding board of regents were instrumental in orchestrating here um because i you know i probably a lot of folks listening probably also don't know what what is life like for indigenous people in the state of Minnesota? Are there like any statistics we can share about, let's say, like education or housing um, and those types of things? Like what are the ongoing material conditions of settler colonialism for indigenous people here um, that, you know, obviously can be traced back to to the, the mass land dispossession through the land grab and the university's pivotal role actually in that? So I think uh, Randall Aki uh, does really great research into this area, and he has uh, an article, I don't recall the name of it right now, but it looks into uh, the land allotment up at White Earth and really draws a connection, a direct connection to indigenous land dispossession and high rates of homelessness, right? And, and if we think about... Uh, just a couple of blocks from the university, right? There is uh, several uh, tent encampments um, within the city of Minneapolis, uh, high rates of indigenous homelessness uh, within those encampments, and uh, a city who continues to ignore and brutalize um, the, the needs of uh, people who are experiencing um, houselessness in this state. Um, if we look at education, right, Minnesota, we already know that uh, Native Americans have some of the lowest educational attainment rates um, for not just high school, but, you know, college too. Uh, Minnesota falls at the bottom of that list consistently. We have the lowest high school graduation rates for Native Americans in the entire uh country, um, some of the lowest home ownership rates, uh, high poverty rates, I believe it's right around 30%. Adriana can correct me on that. We have extremely high rates of uh, children who are taken from their families and um, put into uh, the system. Um, we have extremely high rates of uh, missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. Um, you know, and only recently have has, you know, the government started to like form task force task forces around these issues, um, you know, but we can draw uh, correlations right from land dispossession seven generations ago uh, through, um, you know, generational trauma and, and everything that we know that comes with that. Um, to those current uh, experiences, right? And we don't want to like say that, you know, that's all we have, right? Because we know we also have joy and everything that Adriana mentioned. She's such a good public speaker. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we can't ignore the fact that 
the university was the driving force behind land dispossession in this state, and these are the results of it. So the university can continue to say that they don't have a stake in um, the education gap, right, or the um, housing gaps, but the truth is that they do. Um, and one way that we believe they can start to um, acknowledge that and, and, and to write that is to divert some of those puff streams, right? We know that there's multiple avenues um, or streams, right, that go into this big pool of this puff pool. Um, and if they were to even just take one of those, right, and, and put it into like a fund that was overseen, by tribal people, um, imagine what good that could do for our communities. Um, and so it's just, uh, you know, keeping pressure on the university to use the resources that they stole from us um, and give back everything that they've taken. Oh, you're on mute. Anna, you went off mute and then you went right back on. There you go. Uh, yeah, so 28.5% of Native American people live in poverty today. And so I guess to, to put a little bit more into perspective, um, you know, within the last two years, I probably know at least 10 people that have died from fentanyl overdose, uh, one of which was uh, one of my brothers two weeks after graduation. He was actually sober for 42 days. Um, before OD in eighth time. Um, there was another person, young person, um, who I knew since high school, uh, another one, fentanyl overdose, just a few days ago. Um, I was at a funeral uh, not too long ago either, another overdose. Um, here in Red Lake, we have some of the highest rates of suicide in the entire country. Um, we also are coming up on our annual um, memorial for a school shooting that happened in 2005. Um, and so the trauma from the land dispossession is real. Um, another harrowing statistic is that although Minnesota Indigenous women and girls make up 1% of the state population here, we make up about 8% of the murders, um, which is also very astounding. Uh, again, here in Beltrami County, that number is much higher. Uh, tomorrow, we're hosting our annual um, MMIW walk to honor and to remember our loved ones. And again, um, five plus five women I can just name off the top of my head from this violence. Um, also, the violence that we experience from law enforcement not being heard, seen, or valued from that. Uh, the institutional racism that we experience, again, is tied back uh, to these ideologies that we were less than human. Um, again, these same men that uh, instilled the, the, these racist ideologies um, into America today can be tied back to the University of Minnesota um, and to their, professor, or to their professors in anthropology and all of these different things. Um, and so... Yeah, it's really sad. It's really real out here. Um, it doesn't seem like we can go two or three days uh, without hearing of uh, another person that has passed away that was close. Um, and I think that's probably true for all of us here on this podcast and all communities. Um, it's sad, very sad. Well, that just that just hit me <laughs> right in the gut. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you so all of the work that you've done. I'm again, I'm completely astonished and humbled by the amount of work that you've done. The fact that you're doing the very end of this project without pay getting paid because the funding dried up um, and the university <laughs> you know isn't covering the final part of that bill. Um, and then just the incredible work you do for your people and your community here. Uh, there's a long road, I think, to decolonization here in Minnesota, given what you just shared here. Um, and this seems like it's going to be a really important piece of Indigenous history in this place. And throwing down 
you know, to continue to protect people. And as you said, Adriana, to ensure that the seven generations from now, like our future relatives are going to be living a beautiful life and they're going to have their land back um, because land is the single most, uh, I forgot what the study was, but land is like the single most important thing when it comes to all of the factors for well-being for indigenous people, being able to have a relationship with the land. And if you don't have the land, you know, then you feel very lost. And so, um, I don't know. Oh, I'm getting emotional. This is actually talking about it. They say when you cry at your ancestors speaking through you, but whatever, your ancestors are definitely speaking through you with this project. And it's not a coincidence that it's women um, leading the charge. And I don't know, as an indigenous person who's not from here, I don't, I can just see it. There's a long, it's a, it's a long fight. It's a long fight um, in this place for indigenous liberation, but I don't know, like you have other indigenous people who are looking to you in other places who are going to do this work and they're going to replicate it in their own locations and you're heroes. I mean, like, I, I mean, I'm not really trying to be all dramatic or whatever, but you're really heroes for indigenous people. And like, I can just see this happening in New Mexico and Arizona, you know, it's a really, really big deal. You're literally like breaking through something here with this report. And I don't care what the university has to say. I don't really know how the university can atone <laughs> like for what it has done. Like you can't unbake that cake. But I think what this is going to do for indigenous people here, ooh, I can just feel the fire. <laughs> like I can feel the fire building. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that, like I said, my spirit felt what was happening with this project. And that's what attracted me to it. Um, it wasn't because I'm a professor at this university or anything like that. Um, so keep that spirit strong. Keep your prayers strong as you continue to do the work. And like I said, this is the first episode of five. Um, hopefully we'll be getting to talk to more of the Tribal Research Fellows. You're going to meet more amazing Indigenous people who've contributed to this project. Um, you're going to hear their stories. And there's a lot more to talk about in terms of the history and what what you all have discovered and uncovered and brought back from, like you said, the spaces of silence that were manufactured um, by powerful settlers, including um, the university. And that truth trailing is going to be undeniable, you know, I think when it really comes to the surface. So if you do all have any closing words, I was going to ask you for next steps, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> Other episode. Oh, thank you so much for joining um, and for doing the work that you do. Miigwech. Miigwech.